Okay, well, I'll, I will introduce myself. I'm uh, Beth Richardson. I am one of the co-curators of the current exhibit at Delray Artisans called Expanding the Common Ground, Voices of the Global Majority. And this exhibit is designed to examine our diversity and celebrate our unity. And I think Cheryl's, Cheryl's presentation is a wonderful illustration of this. Okay, now Cheryl was born in Germany. She was the daughter of an army officer and has lived in many places throughout the United States and also, also Asia. She attended high schools in Northern Virginia and Texas and went to the University of Houston, where she graduated with a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in environmental design. And she also has a certification from Sewanee University's Education for Ministry Theology program. Uh, she works as a legal secretary and has for many years in uh, for many DC law firms. Her areas of interest include, I would guess number one, her daughter, Amber. Uh, <laughs> Quilting, writing, mineral, min, uh, mineral, I can't say it. Mineralogy. Thank you. Religious studies, photography, painting, and uh, genealogy. She's a member of the Studio Artists Quilt Association and the Arlington and Burke chapters of Quilters Unlimited of Northern Virginia. And her inspirations are genealogical research and spiritual spirituality. And she describes her quilting style as machine applique with raw edge quilting, with raw edge quilting. Yes. All right. I will turn it over to, to Cheryl now. Oh, one more thing. Uh, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and uh, I'll do my best to get the questions to Cheryl. Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody. It's really great that uh, you could take the time out of your day to join me uh, to hear about my quilt stories. And uh, I'd just like to add that um, I haven't been quilting all that long. I actually attended a quilt show about four or five years ago, ran into one of my guild members, now a guild member, um, who invited me to join. And I just kind of laughed because I was looking at these amazing quilts and saying there's no way I could do that. But I did join after her kind invitation and I struggled. I was trying to do traditional quilting and found out quickly that that wasn't necessarily my thing. And then I saw some art quilts and decided that I would try my hand at that. Um, but truthfully, quilting is quilting and there are many different styles and ways. You just need to find what works best for you, which is what I did. Um, Looking back, I can say I've been influenced by some national and internationally known quilters such as Bisa Butler, Michael Cummings, Libby Williamson, Lisa Ellis, Grandma Moses, Faith Ringel, Keith Bassett, Phyllis Stevens, and Mary Kerr, just to name a few. And of course, uh, most importantly, my own guild members, because they taught me a lot of what I've um, been implementing in my quilts, because believe me, there were, there were some pitiful things that I created in the beginning, but they always encouraged me and gave me tips and, you know, fabric, all kinds of things. And, and I grew from being a member of, of uh, especially the Arlington Guild. Um, now, when we go through my presentation, you'll notice that some of my quilts are smaller. I don't do big quilts. I do wall hanging size, mostly because of space limitation, but also because that's kind of my thing. I like to get done in, an, in a day. So I kind of, I might spend a day or two thinking up the, about the composition, but I will start and finish my projects usually in a day. That's about the length of my attention span and, and it works. Um, also, um, I laugh with my guild members because I'm not a precise person. A lot of them are, they have these meticulous quilts and mine not so much, but my style is a little bit freer. I do raw edge applique. Um, they found out late in the game, I don't always use a rotary blade. I used to just cut things out with my scissors, which was, you know, comical, but I did. And I, I, I've improved some of those habits, but I'm not known to measure every little thing. My, my quilts 
might hang a little wonky, but I love the uniqueness of that. And I always kind of think back to when maybe my ancestors were quilting. Did they have all these modern gadgets to make everything so perfect? Maybe not. So that, that gives me an out. So anyway, let's get started. This first quilt is of my parents. They're both deceased now, but this is these were among the first kind of portrait quilts I tried to do. I did the one on the left of my father with an actual piece of one of his shirts. And you can't tell, but the curtain in the back is hangs kind of freely. Um, he doesn't really look like this, but it kind of captured him. Um, but I was really happy because that's the first time I'd ever done one. And then I did my mother on the right using trapunto where you stuff it from behind. So like her chest area kind of extends and you can't tell, but the plant is actually kind of 3D too. But I was really pleased with those because I um, that was my first time. Then I did some, uh, these two slides were from uh, my visits to Arlington Cemetery where they're both buried. Um, and again, I just was doing my raw edge applique, um, just kind of freestyling um, compositions that I would come up with. And the one on the right, I really like because I love Van Gogh and I really try to let the fabric do the work for me. So the direction of some of the designs in the fabric can lend itself towards perspective and things like that. And just that whole color, it has a very Van Gogh look. These two are, of course, my parents with my daughter as an infant. Um, I wish they were alive to see it because I really love these two quilts. Um, the one of my father really captured an image I had of him and my daughter having this conversation. Um, and I think um, it, it really works with the connection of the eyes with my daughter kind of looking up at him. And for people who knew my dad, they said, you know, yes, you really captured his smile there. And I, because I do things in kind of a simplified manner, I give the illusion and let your eye fill out the rest. Like you see, he's, you just see kind of like the back of his chair. Um, and I have been known to hide things if I don't know how to make them. To the right is um, a, a quote of my mother holding my daughter. And my mother passed not long after my daughter was born. So I had a picture of her holding Amber and, and that was just really, really special to me. Um, it really captured the joy on her face that day because uh, I was least likely to have a child. And, and it was just a special moment. And I think that's what's really important about quilting and my desire to do um, quilts of my family and faith and ancestry is I want this story, uh, my quilt story to pass down to my daughter, especially, and, and to my siblings, if they listen, they're not really into genealogy or all the stuff that I am into, but this I feel is my legacy to my daughter. Speaking of which, these are quilts of my siblings. Um, the one on the left, when I first made it, I, I kind of trembled because I was like, they're gonna kill me because of uh, the caricatures, you know, they kind of looked that way, but in fact, they loved it. They thought it was really cute. Um, the one in the middle is one of my daughter. Um, and the one to the right is my youngest brother with his three sons. So like it or not, I've captured them and, and they're a part of my quilt story now. Then I got into genealogy uh, because I joined a lineage society. I'm in the process of going through that whole, um, that whole process of uh, verifying things. But I found an old picture of my great grandparents, my maternal great grandparents, and I've captured them here. And like Bisa Butler, I was really inspired by how she uses color for highlights and shadows. And so I tried to do that with this, um, this particular quilt. And, and I, I really like it because it's unexpected with blues and the face and, and that, but I, I think it works. I like it. Then I have my mother's parents. Um, here, totally different. And I was really flattered because um, the one on the right of my paternal grandfather, 
um, he's, he had remarried, he had kids by second wife. And one of his sons saw my quilt on Facebook and was like, oh my God, that's my dad. And I was really touched that he could recognize that because I kind of wondered, you know, I never, I don't remember meeting him in life. I just had a picture of him. And when I do these, a lot of times I'll look at a picture and I'll just try to either freestyle it and, and make it look like that. Sometimes I kind of make a pattern by tracing over the image and enlarging it. And um, if I think it's going to be something difficult to just to try to capture the, um, the um, composition. And then to the right, I visited my maternal grandmother's grave in Louisiana and wanted to capture that as part of the quilt story. This is my maternal great grandmother, the grandfather you just saw, that's his mother. And um, we didn't have a lot of pictures, you know, of, of some of our ancestors. And I found this one and I really was happy to just try to capture her. Of course, she's not around to see it, but hopefully future generations will. And again, I used the fabric to kind of work the composition. Um, I created the chair. Um, and just uh, did my best to kind of capture, you know, her expression at that time. This is one of my mother um, and me, and it's special to me because living in Thailand, she had a lot of Thai silk, beautiful silks and stuff. And one of my guild members had gifted me this silk. And um, I knew when I just saw it that I wanted to do this composition of my mother and me. And um, I'm really happy with the way it came out. Um, it just, it really captures a moment when, where we had gone to high tea together and just really enjoying each other. And it's one of my special memories. Then I have my paternal grandparents. Um, my grandfather really does not look like Al Roker, but he does in this quilt. But um, they were very formal people. And uh, I, I captured that here. I mean, they were very, you know, put together. And he he used to sit at the table dressed in a coat, and not a coat and tie, but a shirt and tie many times. And my grandmother they just came from that generation where, you know, everything had to be just so. So when I see these quilts, I think about that. It kind of makes me smile. These two quilts are two of my favorites, really, because the one on the left is that grandfather's uh, family. When he was a teenager, he was about 17. That's him in the green sitting in the front next to his father with the green and red. Um, and that's his mother standing with his, her arm on his shoulder and his siblings behind him. Um, and I captured the dress that they had on, the style of dress they had on in, in the photo. Um, and I, this is also special to me because when my, right before my father passed, he left these in an envelope with my name on it. So that made me feel good that he was aware of my genealogy interest and who knew it, it would end up in a quilt. To the right, some of my paternal cousins and aunts um, that uh, were, uh, let's see, I think, yeah, they were related to my grandfather. And this was just a cute composition of many of them together. And I found that, you know, I don't have to put in the faces. You saw in some of the earlier quotes, I did the eyes and the nose and they, you know, if you don't do them right, they can look a little cartoony, but this I think captures the whole feel of uh, the photos I was looking at just by the compositions, the relations, how they're touching each other, the grouping, and, and that works just fine. Hey, Cheryl. Yes. Uh, we do have a question um, from Rita Cohen who asked, how do you do the details of the face? I guess on the ones where you do a detail, fabric pieces, <laughs> paint, ink, or shaded fabric? I don't paint. I know some people do, I, I mean, I paint, but that's another thing, but I don't paint my fabrics. A lot of times I work really hard, as you'll see in maybe some of the other quilts to come, trying to capture the eyes, getting the nose just right. I have yet to really make it, I don't do realistic portraits like some of these people do, but my some of the features did improve um, as I made more quilts. But it's just trial and error. And I'm the kind of person, 
I don't seek perfection. I, you know, it's more the general mood and I just do my best. I try. And um, a lot of times I'm just happy with the composition. Yeah. They're not realistic, but, but they're never going to be with me. This is a special one. This is of my second great grandmother who lived in Louisiana. She was born a slave. Um, and then once freed, a distant cousin of mine told me he remembered going to her house on the weekends and how she loved to garden and um, just what a sh little small but strong woman she was. And she was, you know, tell them stories about how she was treated as a slave and everything. But this quilt just to me is like joy and happiness. It's bright. Uh, those dark slave days are gone. And it just really, to me, captures what must have been her joy of spending time, you know, in her garden. And I, I love the Van Gogh kind of skies in the back. I love those colors. This is my third great grandmother, my maternal third great grandmother. She was a daughter of, uh, of the slave owner, my fourth great grandfather. Um, and we, I have one picture of her and I translated that into a, um, this quilt here. And um, I just styled her, you know, in a manner that was dignified. And I used the echoing quilting stitching behind. Um, the other one where you saw my second great grandmother, I used more directional um, quilting stitches to, to lend itself toward the perspective and take you into the drawing. This is actually um, my fourth great grandfather's plantation. I visited it a few years ago in Louisiana before um, a guy had bought it and renovated it. And that was a surreal experience. Um, yeah, to walk the grounds where your enslaved ancestors lived is quite something. But um, I wanted to capture how I envisioned it um, with people there working, of course, and um, I, I, I treasure this quilt. And I also was given a slave made brick on my visitor that actually has fingerprints. So those are phenomenal to me. And I, um, I want my daughter to be able to appreciate our past. Um, this is the Quaker meeting house that is near Fort Belvoir and adjacent to Woodlawn Plantation. During my um, lineage research, I am actually a descendant of early Quakers to America. My 10th great grandfather was a Hollingsworth who came here with um, William Penn. And down our line, we have Penn in a lot of the ancestors' names and uh, my 10th great grandfather was a signer of the Great Charter. And some of the some of the distant Quaker relatives also helped build this Quaker house that being military, we lived here off and on many times. And I used to drive by that Quaker house many, many, many times, never dreaming that I had any connection to it, but I do and am um, in fact related to Buckman's and the Jannies, which are streets that are familiar in Alexandria. But yeah, this is a Quaker house and that's a cool part of my history. Here are quilts that depict my nephews, my youngest brother's sons, and it captures um, an afternoon in Las Vegas when I trapped them and I was telling them all of our genealogy history and showing them pictures of our ancestors and they never knew their, their mother is Russian and they just didn't know much about our family history. And um, I, I was so thrilled to have an opportunity to share this with them. And it was funny because after about 45 minutes, they're like, okay, yeah, sure, we're done. So, but these quilts are here forever. So <laughs> they had 45 minutes, but they're gonna see these again. And then to the right, the quilt on the right, um, just reminds me of doing my research. I had been in the uh, various libraries, Library of Congress, um, the archives, National Archives, DAR Library, all these places, looking for my roots. And when I see this, it just reminds me. And here you can see I used the fabric in the back, uh, the striped fabric to kind of give you the illusion of books and then 
some of the stitching to take you through the space to kind of create a perspective of the room. Uh, move your eye from the front of the quilt towards the back. Hey, I have another question. Mm -hmm. uh, this is from Bridget. She asks, are you using photo transfers on the fabrics, fabric with the plants? No, I'm not. I just cut out strips of fabric. I place them, I lay them out, you know, and with applique, you can actually, you know, like if you have a print with florals on it, you can fussy cut it or whatever, but I don't, I don't do photo transfers really. Uh -uh. This is a picture of my daughter with her father. Um, we just put him in there. And, um, <laughs> And I think it's cute. She she doesn't like it so much, but you know he's he's part of the picture, so there he is. And then to the right are a couple is is my DNA cousin and her husband. And during my research, we found out we were fifth cousins, and she drove down from Missouri to meet me and my siblings, and uh, just really a um, fun time connecting. Uh, with new family members. Uh, we are her only living relatives and definitely she had to be a part of my quilt story here. This uh, quilt to the left is a picture of my dad before he passed with my stepmother. Um, and the one to the right is a, just a picture of a, a praying girl. I belong to an order called the Order of the Daughters of the King. And prayer is a big part of it. So at the time, I thought this would be a very uh, appropriate theme to, to work on. This is from, this quilt is a quilt of one of my dearest friends. We were friends when I first went to college. Um, she still lives in Houston and she she is a good support for me. I'm always showing her my quotes. Look what I did. Look what I did. So I made one of um, her along with her husband, and I actually sent it to them. This quote is kind of fun on the left, showing my DNA cousins and how we're all linked, we're all touching each other. A um, couple of these women here are sisters, and we have been going to church quite a long time before we found out we were seventh cousins. This is a picture of my cousin from Missouri. One lives in Maryland, one lives in DC. This cousin lives in Missouri, I mean, in Mississippi. And we're all cousins and we just have the best time. And I remember telling a story to this cousin about how I didn't have any family quilts, nobody quilted in my family. And she actually sent me a very worn, you know, kind of crazy quilt that her great, great grandmother had made. And I was so touched by that because she goes, we're family and you, you deserve to have a family quilt. On the right uh, is a quilt of Kamala Harris. And I started doing a series called my historic moments quilt. And so I did one of her. This is one of my favorite um, presiding Bishop Curry. Michael Curry, and um, I worked hard. Somebody had asked me about doing the features. This is one I worked very hard on. I knew I couldn't make it look exactly like him, but I did try to capture the essence of his spirit. He's just such um, an amazing man and a very positive, happy man. So I really worked hard on his smile and his eyes, which if anybody knows him or has met him, you, you can tell this is definitely oh. him. Cheryl, and then I did. Yes. Cheryl, just, I just had to interject here. Dorothy Friedlander commented that you, she thinks you captured Bishop Curry perfectly. Thank you, Dorothy. <laughs> and I also have uh, Bridget has asked if you could uh, tell us what the scale is of your pieces. Well, most of these, you know, I can't tell the exact sizes anymore. It would take too long, but most of them are, tend to be about, I would say, twenty by twenty-four, seventeen by twenty-four. They're really not big. They're wall hanging size, but they're, yeah, they're about anywhere from 17 or 20 inches to about 24, 26 inches. Sometimes they're a little bigger, sometimes a little smaller, just depends. The one on the right is um, just, you know, women in, in the pulpit and it try, I tried to show some diversity and in all kinds of ways with women um, in the pulpit. This one to the left is uh, 
Jesus speaking to the multitudes, and I have a whole religious series, um, and I use, you can see the quoting lines emanating from him out among the masses. So this is the fishes and loaves story here. They're the little fish and the fish and the bread over here, if you can see them. Um, to the right is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter walking on the water towards Jesus. And I used the fabric to depict this, you know, stormy, turbulent feel. And I couldn't make a ship. So I used actually the fabric to kind of give the illusion of sails and the ship. And I, you know, hopefully you, you can kind of envision it. This one is a picture of Mary of Bethany wiping Jesus's feet with her hair and her tears. Kind of has an exotic look to me because of the background fabric, but and the colors. But I kind of, I kind of like it. This is another favorite of mine, the Last Supper, and I used the quilting lines emanating from the host uh, here and making the turning into the planes of the table. Um, and I like the cos, the use of this fabric in the back, it kind of gives it a cosmic feel. And um, here's Judas over here with his bag of silver coins, um, not a part of the group there, but not really a part of the group. Oh, I love the vibrant colors of this one because I had some African fabric and sometimes I have difficulty quilting with African fabrics because they're really bold colors or the designs are such that I'm always, I look at them like, well, I don't really know what I could do with it. But this one, I kind of created the, the wise and foolish virgin uh, theme, making the foolish virgins over here on the left. And I just kind of made these tints out of fabric and um, put the illusion of their groomsmen back here, but they're totally oblivious. They're not paying attention while the wise virgins over here are tending their fire. You know, they've got their oil lamps, they're preparing and here their groomsmen come in the back. But I love the intensity of the colors. This one is uh, The Empty Tomb. I did some of the quotes from my favorite books of the Bible. And this is, you know, this shows Mary Magdalene down here in the corner weeping because she comes and she finds the tomb empty. The stone is rolled away, but Jesus is over here. And, you know, Holy Spirit represented there. This one represents Pentecost. Just very simple figures. Um, depicting Jesus and the disciples with the Holy Spirit, you know, captured by the flames on their head. And this too was African fabric. And this is constellation fabric, you know, if you could see this, but yeah, I, I kind of like the movement of it. And this one is uh, Jesus sending the disciples out to all corners to spread the good news. They're kind of sad looking disciples, but they're going out nonetheless. <laughs> And then this, these two are both Exodus. I did the one on the left, just using a bunch of different fabrics to give a desert effect. Um, I, the moon and the hair came from a piece of African fabric. I like that kind of glow because, you know, we, in the story, it says Moses' face and everything was changed after he went up the mountain. So I thought that kind of lent itself towards uh, that part of the story. And there he is with his tablets as Ten Commandments, and there's a golden calf, if you look very carefully, uh, out here. And these are some embarrassed um, wanderers here in the desert because they know they should have been messing with that calf. And then here we have uh, Moses parting the sea so that the people can cross and get over here. And if you look, you can see fish hanging out. <laughs> then I did a couple St. Francis quilt. This one I gave to one of my cousins. Um, and this one I made for myself, but I, I liked it because I kind of did it in the round. I did the quilting in the round and I kind of placed the animals the, the same way. This one, more perspective. You can see the house in the background and various animals all around. Okay, we have another question, Cheryl. Okay. Um, from Barbara Haugen says she loves how you let the fabric do the work for you but she's wondering whether you get an idea for a quilt and then get particular fabric 
or for example, with the one with Peter walking on the water, did you specifically purchase fabric for the stormy sea or was it something you already had? No, you know, I, it's really funny. I'm not that organized. I will come up with an idea. I'll kind of wake up like, oh, I'm going to do this. And then I just start looking through my stash and I, I'll pull out fabrics that, you know, kind of lend themselves towards what I'm thinking. But no, I rarely shop looking for fabrics for a particular quilt. To me, the fun is using the fabric, like whatever you have to, you know, to create what you're going to do. I mean, most quilters have a lot of fabric. Um, and then um, a lot of my friends give me fabric, like they know I do a certain style. So they'll say, oh, I saw this, I thought of you or whatever. So I have a lot of different kinds and it's just fun um, to see what you come up with. Yeah. I do know, you know, a lot of quilters will go shop for the precise thing, but since I don't cut precisely, I don't shop precisely either. I just um, will use what I have. This one of St. Josephine Paquita um, is one like that. I used all kinds of different fabric for the colors and to create um, her story. And she, for people who don't know who she is, she was a Sudanese, well, she, she was Sudanese and she was kidnapped by the Arabs as a child. And she ended up, you know, being enslaved and had a horrible upbringing. And then she ended up in Italy with a family that owned her and there slavery wasn't allowed. And she became um, the doorkeeper of a convent there. And she fell down at the baptismal font and said, truly, I am a daughter of the king. So this was actually a, um, uh, the name of a chapter of the daughter of the king I belong to, but I I wanted to represent that the um, Arabic uh, influence. So I kind of did the crescent moon thing in the back um, and the used fabric back here, depicting that she was a saint, kind of that halo effect. And like Bisa Butler, I still was trying to use a bunch of different colors to capture, you know, the contours of her face. It kind of has a little bit of a Picasso look if you use your imagination. The eyes are kind of crooked and it's very, you know, it's not traditional looking, but I do like it. Yeah. Okay. I do. I think I know the answer to this. Nancy Pitcher asks, how do you organize your fabric? Well, I organize my fabric by not organizing it. It's usually just there. Um, it, it might start out organized, as you know, Nancy, and then once you start quilting it just kind of explodes into piles but I just dig through them and find what I want yeah I nothing's organized I must say so to the right I did Saint Faustina same kind of thing different I did more uh, monochromatic colors for for her Saint Teresa and Padre Pio this one I actually sent to a cousin and is hanging in their church. Um, and Padre Pio, I just thought it was cool. His, his story is an amazing uh, one with the stigmata and all that. So yeah, I definitely had to do him. And who would do saints and not do Saint Corona, who was martyred for her faith? Um, but I did this, I, of course, in the middle of the pandemic, it seemed appropriate. And um, this was a gift to my friend Daria. And then this one, St. Hildegard, known as the doctor of the church for her gifts of music and writing. That was for another guild member. Then um, just to, having some fun, I thought of this one day when I was thinking about quilting, like I have the audacity to quilt. So that's what this one is called, the audacity to quilt. And I just had fun with the colors and the fabric. Um, making it look like it really was quilting there and see the low heart for my love of quilting. So this one was called We're All in This Together. And that that was just, to, you know, kind of to show joy and movement during a time just when I was feeling really down. I was sick of the pandemic. I was sick of the politics and I just needed to do something fun. Um, and so I just made their clothing out of scraps of fabric and just put a lot of movement and um, imagination into this piece. I, 
I just think it, I love the colors and again, the Van Gogh looking fabric too. This uh, quote here, um, I made several of these and I don't typically like to make the same quote more than once, but this quote uh, I made when Justice Ginsburg passed and a friend of mine and I had gone up to the Supreme Court to lay um, flowers on the steps. And I just saw a you know, vast array of emotions there. And I thought, you know, Justice Ginsburg would want us to have hope. And so I came home and I made this quilt and I just wanted to show the diversity of people, faiths, all wanting the same thing. And uh, I used this style of quilting, which looks like a fingerprint, just to show that we're all unique, but we're, we're still people wanting the same thing. Um, and as it turned out, my, the firm for which I work uh, used this quilt, the image of this quilt on their diversity webpage and on their diversity cookbook. And I think I made three or four of these. People really like this one because it just captures the spirit of unity and diversity. And the same with the one on the right. Like we're all people, no matter the color, um, no matter the hairstyle or whatever, you know, we're, we're, we're the same. Um, this one was just called, um, I'm not bored, I'm a quilter. And I, again, did this during the pandemic. I, for a while, I was doing like one a day. And I kind of like this one because I have these baskets. These are actually little rolls of fabric rolled up and stuffed in like a pocket. And it just kind of shows me sitting there quilting away. Um, yeah. And then to the right, um, a mermaid, I think it's called Mermaids at Play or something like that, I can't remember. Um, this is a, I really like this one, it's kind of a fantasy thing and there's, you can barely see, but there's a mermaid over here diving for these hoops, these bubbles or whatever. And um, this quilt actually, I think this quilt, or maybe it was a different one, was actually entered in my first juried show. So I was really happy about that. Um, but here um, is where I did fussy cutting of, you know, pieces of fabric to create the, the blades of grass or whatever and the rock fabric that a lot of us are familiar with. And I just used some of that Van Gogh fabric for the sky back there and various fabrics to create the rocks and the mountains, just layering. So the rocks and the uh, hills that she's sitting on. Oh, Cheryl, I... There's a comment here that I I like <laughs> I think is really cool. I wanted to bring to your attention from uh, Suzanne Ok or Ock Ock. <laughs> Please forgive me, Suzanne. Says, I love how your dress in the first one looks like it has a spider web design. Nature's quilters. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? When I saw that fabric, I thought the same thing. It was a piece of African fabric I had. But it did look like spider webs, and maybe it's supposed to. But I just love that, you know, the the design of it and the colors. Yeah, and I mean, I hate spiders, but yes, they 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 create some masterful webs. That's for sure. These are um, quilted postcards that I made. I had I had been coveting them. I never made any. And one of our guild members gave us a demonstration on how, so I made quite a few, and these are just some pictures of them. I had a hard time mailing them out. <laughs> and then I love landscapes, whether painting or quilting, but I love landscapes. So I kind of did this desert quilt um, at night, and I did this of a friend with her, this is of her sister and her niece, um, and this was a gift for her. And these were all from, taken from a, um, a pattern called Hap Cozy, Cozy Village. So I didn't make it exactly the way they had it. I kind of took it and made it my own, but I, I liked uh, the images of the houses or the churches, the kind of rural scenes and um, made, you know, a few of these. Uh, they, they were a lot of fun, kind of simple. I think I gave these away and I still have this one. 
then I did my historic moment. So this was 40 acres and a mule. If you look back there, there's a little mule. It's not the best picture. I'm sorry, it's a little blurry. But I um, wanted to show like these, um, you know, in formerly enslaved people working on the field and, you know, hopefully doing something for themselves with their 40 acres. Then I did Juneteenth. Um, which, you know, is really celebrated more in the South, like Texas, of course, and Louisiana. I mean, I didn't grow up celebrating Juneteenth, although I certainly knew about it from my parents who were from Louisiana and from living in Texas. So in this quote, I show the slave owner there. Texas, of course, was the last to know slavery was over. But um, anyway, here I have the man working down here and, and the woman and their joyous freedom, crying freedom, and the sun kind of setting on a period, you know, hopefully slavery, you know, the hope was that was the end of sla slavery. So I tried to depict all that. And there, of course, is the state of Texas in the background. This is um, Brea College, and it is um, of uh, the first integrated college, not just integrated, but co-ed um, in the South. It was in Kentucky and um, a wealthy landover, landowner named Cassius Clay um, offered to give this to, I think the guy's name was Reverend Fee. And he said, if you would, you know, use it for this college, I'll give you the land to put it on. Well, as it turned out, um, as it turned out, Cassius Clay's, Muhammad Ali's father named him after Cassius Clay because they were abolitionists and he, I guess, was very impressed with him. So he named Muhammad Ali Cassius Clay after this man. Um, but of course, when Muhammad um, converted, he, he got rid of that name. Now, somebody had asked me about photo transfers for this, I did print an image on canvas, but you know, so I did that rather than actually transferring it. Um, but usually I don't do that. Um, and then I just, you know, freestyle cut the, the trees and the path to add perspective and use my quilting to create the sky. But this is, you know, I mean, when I did this series, I, I did learn a lot because, um, I, I didn't know that's how Cassius Clay got his name. This is called the, the Door of No Return. And I think there, there's more than one. This one is in Senegal, but of course it's when, you know, the slaves were captured and they were kept up here in these pens and taken through the, this door of no return. And if you went through here, you weren't coming back. Um, you boarded a slave ship going to the islands or going to the, uh, to, you know, America. And it was like the trail of tears by sea. Um, here it shows, you know, some of the slaves choosing to drown themselves rather than get on the ship. Um, it's, a, it's a sad time. Um, so, yeah. The Lorraine uh, Motel, of course, were uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was murdered, and I just kept it very simple. Um, but here he is with this laying down here with his friends helping him. And um, Andrew Young was a part of that. Um, he was good, his parents were good friends of my grandparents, and I wanted to show him here. And there they are all pointing at the at the killer. But you can see here how I try to simplify things to tell the story. I wasn't going to make the whole hotel, but, you know, you get the, the gist. And then Brown versus the Board of Education. I saw a picture of the kids and I tried to capture them here, um, kind of created the school looking building in the background there, um, used the sign to say, you know, to for the quilt label there and um, just kind of raw edge applique the scenery around it. But I think it's fun when doing, during the people, just getting their posture, you know, how they relate to each other, the different skin tones, it, it, the, the wardrobe, trying to make it 
trying to date it to that time was a lot of fun. Then I did these historic moments, of course, of um, the 101st Congressional Address with Kamala um, Harris and Pelosi and Biden, and then with, uh, with Barack Obama. And again, I just avoid features. It's just, you know, you get the gist. That shouldn't be in there. We've already seen it. But this is the one that's hanging in um, Delray Artisans of um, Misty Copeland, uh, who, you know, really is a star, African-American star in, in the world of ballet. And this is, this is one of the latest ones I've done. This is a uh, Huntley Mansion, uh, which I was commissioned to do um, off of Harrison Lane. And uh, it was, uh, let's see, George Mason's grandson's summer plantation, if I remember correctly. Then I, these are the children of some clergy friends of mine that live in Wales. They wanted gifts for their in-laws and parents. So I did this of their sons, just crazy colors and patterns. And it's really funny because the, the wife said that she actually used this quote because she had a game. She would play with her sons about colors and shapes. And she's like, I can't believe you picked, you know, the fabric you did for that quilt. It really worked out well. And uh, these are, uh, I just made this one last week, two of my Quaker friends. Um, this one had written a book called As They Were Led about the Quakers and the Native Americans. And uh, these two were actually cousins and behind her, she, she had reached around and was pointing to her book. And this lady too was a Quaker friend who passed last year, but was very instrumental in the Alexandria Meeting House. She just did so much for, for that meeting house. So this is gonna hang there. And then I tried to do a, just a floral here. This is just uh, cutting out the applique and stitching it, um, raw edge applique. These are kind of whimsical too. This is called In a World of My Own. Um, one of my friends gave me this fabric. I just thought it was so cool. It reminded me of like a sci-fi movie with the mini moons or suns in there. So I used some of this Van Gogh looking fabric to create the background. And she's actually 3D, just laying there reading her books and her knees are bent. And yeah, it's just kind of fun. And this is one of the first quilts I made years ago when I was really going to my mineral club meetings and I found images of the minerals and I would print them out on canvas. Then I got actual pieces of minerals, put them in the silk cloth and the silk bags and made this mineral quilt. And this just says, you know, it was hanging in one of, it was entered in one of the Quilters Unlimited shows a long time ago. So anybody can Anybody can have something in the quilt show. Um, oh, Cheryl. Yeah. Uh, Bridget has asked, on average, how long do you spend on a piece? Usually about nine hours, sometimes five. It depends how intricate it is. But like I said in the beginning, I, um, I don't want to work on them more than a day. I will usually get them done in a day. So about, you know, usually no more than 10 hours. Um, this is a landscape piece I gave to um, a clergy friend of mine. And this one too, just using different kinds of fabrics and using the front and the back of fabrics to get certain effects. This is a landscape I did um, with, a, with a, a guild friend of mine. I, and I love trying new things. You know, some of the quotes, I love how they start putting things on the outside, like, you know, it expands the space. And when I see this quilt, it reminds me of um, Bob Ross, because I used to do Bob Ross style paintings with the happy clouds and all that. And every time I see this, this is what it reminds me of. I just did this for somebody, just fun colors. They wanted something with a bridge. So I tried to incorporate it. Um, yeah no real point. This one I did for a raffle um, for one of the lineage societies uh, that, I'm, that I'm interested in. And it's of Nellie Custis, 
Um, look, you know, if you're if you visit Woodlawn and look out the window upstairs, you'll see this, you know, grove of trees and everything. So this was called Nellie Takes a Walk. So this was actually auctioned off. This one to the right is of um, the Mount Vernon Slave Memorial um, in 1990. I wrote a poem for one of the dedication ceremonies they had there that my mother and I were involved with, with bringing recognition to the Slave Memorial. And so to me, this is really symbolic because if you've ever visited uh, Mount Vernon and seen the Slave Memorial, the slaves are not buried in a specific spot. They're just scattered on the ground. So this memorial was, memorial was to recognize their presence. Um, I made the base of it different colors uh, to represent the various African countries from which they came. I used a Statue of Liberty kind of broken here because they weren't free. Um, and George Washington, because of course it was his land. Okay. Um, Thank you. Okay. Questions? Oh, I have one came in <laughs> from Barbara Haugen, who asked, how do you construct your quilts? Do you first fuse the elements before you raw edge quilt them? Um, usually I, I am, I've thought about what I wanted to do and I just start laying them out. I, I pick my background fabric, the sky, the middle ground, the foreground. I just start cutting and laying them out. I, you know, I don't labor over it. Usually when I start, I know what I want to do. Um, and I start creating the landscaping around it and, and put my figures in. So it's, you know, it's kind of a smooth process for me because I thought about it. I either woke up with this idea or I say, hey, I saw this on the news. I want to capture that. You know, I, I pretty much have a theme in mind, which makes it very easy to do. But I don't do a lot of, you know, oh, let me draw this. Let me do that. Sometimes I'll kind of loosely sketch things out just to uh, work on the composition. But usually I don't need to. Okay. And Cree asks, how long have you been doing these? Such a huge catalog. And you only saw some of them. I have, I have over a hundred, but I, I would say I started quilting five years ago when I joined the Arlington Guild. I started doing these portrait quilts maybe two years ago when we were in the pandemic. That's kind of when I started. I did a few um, Happy Village quilts, if you remember from Karen Eckridge. I think maybe about three or four years ago. And that's when I realized that working small worked better for me. Um, but over the pandemic, I've used that time of solitude and everything else, just keeping safe, um, to, to just work on my quotes. And it really did help me um, with the monotony of just being inside every single day. I would, you know, wake up, think, hey, I'm going to make this today or that. And I would pretty much for I don't know how many, how long I did a quilt a day. Okay, any other questions? Well, thank you guys so much. I appreciate your time and wanting to wanting to hear my quilt story. I really do. Okay, and I I just want to uh, just let everyone know. I just put in the in the chat a link to the Delray Artisans website. You can have more more information about the organization and the gallery, and uh, our the current show uh, expanding the common ground will be will be there through October thirtieth. The gallery hours are uh, Thursday twelve to six, Friday twelve to nine, and Sunday twelve to six. Uh, the last Sunday, the last Sunday, the gallery is closed because that's. You know, we we have a new exhibit every every month, but please uh, please come and see the other amazing uh, pieces that are that are in the show. And thank you again for joining us.